carry the load. And uh, today what we're going to do is uh, talk about a uh, uh, problem in uh, system identification which has to do with extending our state estimator to a different domain. And the problem that I want to tell you about is called subspace identification. It's a me method that was discovered in the late 90s, so it's fairly new. And it allows us to solve the following problem. What we want to do is ask the question, now that we've done state estimation, how do we solve the problem associated with understanding the structure of our system? So if we have a system of the variety this, What we've done so far in class, we've learned how to estimate the state of the system. So we know if we knew, given A, B, C, D, and the noises associated with epsilon x of epsilon y, and some prior belief x hat of 1 given 0 and uncertainty, we would be able to estimate the state of the system. But what I want to talk about today is that how do we get this? How do we get the state from state estimation and the structure of the system from our data? And the problem that we face is as follows. We have the following things. We have u, the vector that's gone from u1 to up. And then we have our observation y, which has gone from y1 to yp, and what we want to know is that how do we estimate a, b, c, d, and the noises and the initial conditions? That's our problem. Now, to get to our problem, I want to motivate it using um, a, an example. And the example that I want to use is from robotics. It involves a little bit of nomenclature that you haven't seen before, but it's nothing that I don't think you can handle. So suppose that I have, a, um, I have an arm here, like this. And um, my arm is going to move into space. So he has its link here, and it has a link there. And I'm going to define some angles, q1 and q2. And if I write the dynamics of the system moving in say, two-dimensional space, although just two dimensions is easy to write it, but in principle this is true anyway. So if I represent my torques as tau 1 and tau 2, they're going to be related to my angular position velocity acceleration via some matrix, which we're going to call inertia. This is going to be a matrix that depends on some parameters A, some vector Q, the position of my arm, times q1 double dot, q2 double dot, plus another set of forces that are called Coriolis and centripetal forces. And that's going to be represented by some other matrix, which I'm going to call C, which depends on some parameter A, and another uh, state, which is going to be my velocity, times q1 dot and q2 dot. And basically, the reason I put this in here as q dot is because what happens is that velocities, in the case of um, Coriolis forces, are going to be squared. So there's this, this, this relationship. Anyway, the point being that this system has some description of how forces are, are related to velocities and positions. And um, if, if I now wanted to write the same problem for a slightly different system, so say that my arm is holding a tennis racket. Say I'm holding a tennis racket. And I wanted to control the system as well. So I want to say, OK, what's changed in this structure of this equation? And um, what I'm going to show you that what, what changes is, is nothing interesting other than this parameter A. There's some, some parameter that describes things like length of this link 
the location of its center of mass, length of this link, the location of its center of mass. The, 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 the center of mass changes when I hold the racket in my arm. It becomes like this. It becomes a vector like this. It has some angle. It's called gamma with respect to my forearm. But these things, length, location of center of mass, and these angles are in parameter A. And so if I knew the structure of dynamics, then I could estimate A from when my hand is not holding anything to when my hand is holding a tennis racket. So what changes is a parameter in this equation. The structure of this equation doesn't change. Okay? So the point is, if I knew the structure of the system, then I could do state estimation, find the parameter that I'm looking for, and use the usual common filter. But if I didn't know the structure of the system, then the problem is much harder. Because it's not linear, it has all these terms in these functions which I don't know about, and so forth. So let me show you how this problem could be solved if you knew the structure of that system, how you would use state estimation techniques. Even though this is not a linear problem, you could use the state estimation techniques to find the parameters that you're interested in. So you could control just as well the thing holding a tennis racket as this one holding nothing. So um, what, what I need to do is to write this equation. This equation is called inverse dynamics. Why is it called inverse dynamics? Because forward dynamics is the relationship between inputs, forces, and outputs, changes in states. So if we would write this equation in terms of Q double dot and how it depends on some function that has you know, A in it, it has Q dot in it, it has Q in it, it has torque in it, this would be called forward dynamics. And in the, the way we've been writing equations of motion, things like this, these are forward dynamics equations. This is called inverse dynamics. So F is equal to MA, F is equal to M times X double dot, this is inverse dynamics. And when I wrote this equation, torque is equal to some function of angular accelerations plus some function of angular velocities, this is what I'm writing. F is equal to ma. But I'm writing it in the coordinate system of this complicated system. It's not a point mass. It's this you know, multi-link system. But really, that's what I'm writing. I'm writing F is equal to ma in joint coordinates. That's called inverse dynamics. If I now solve for Q double dot, what I would be writing is forward dynamics. So let's, let's solve for Q double dot. So this is equal to um, H minus 1, this matrix here, times, which is a function of A and Q, times um, torque um, uh, minus times C, which is a function of A, Q, and Q dot. All right, so um, this, is, this is forward dynamics. It's a nonlinear equation because in this matrix H, I have cosines and sines, and, and similarly, of course, here. And so how would I, you know, how would I Wanted, how would I write this so I could, state, I could estimate things? So what I'm interested in is A. It's how do I find, do I estimate A, this vector A. So why do I want to estimate A? Because A has the physical properties of my system. For example, in this vector A, I have things like the mass of the upper arm. I have the length to the center of mass of the upper arm. I have the mass of this um, uh, tennis racket that I'm holding, and the vector that tells me the, the point, the position of the center of mass with respect to my elbow. So the physical parameters of the system are in this, on this vector A. The rest of these equations are about how those physical parameters get translated into this equations of motion. So when I'm holding a tennis racket versus a ping pong paddle versus nothing, what I'm changing is A. And so how do I do state estimation so that I can compute A? 
So what I want to do is to write this, this nonlinear equation in a linear form and do, um, and do state estimation. So the, typically what, the way you, you, know, you take a nonlinear equation and write a linear form is you use Taylor series expansion. So um, uh, this is, this is my, my function g, and uh, it's a nonlinear function. So you know, I, have some, uh, I have some estimate of the state. So what is state here? So let me write x as, as a state. It is position, it is velocity, it is a. This is what I mean by state. And this is a vector, this is a vector, this is a vector. And so um, I have some estimate of the state, I have some x hat. So what I can do is write q double dot as the following, as this function g evaluated at my state x hat and some torque t, it's going to be some, some constant. Um, then I'm going to add to it the first derivative of g with respect to x, evaluate it as x hat, multiplied by x minus x hat. So that's my linearization of the system. This is a constant, and this is a linear function of the difference between the actual state x and my estimate of it at, at, at x hat. So, um, so what I do now is that I just write my state update equation. So let me, let me, let's see if I can fit it here. So my, my velocity um, at some time q dot is, um, uh, sorry, let's start with q. q at t plus delta, my first time step, is going to be equal to q at time t plus q dot at time t times delta. That's my time step. My q dot at time t plus delta is going to be q dot at time t plus q double dot at time t times delta. What is q double dot? Here's q double dot. And then finally, I have my uh, vector a at time t plus delta is going to be equal to vector at time t plus maybe some noise, epsilon a. And let's put a matrix a in front of that to, you know, to add some stability to it, you know, make, making it so that whatever parameter values I have tend to be very consistent from trial to trial. So here's my. Here's my state update equation. And my observation y at time t is going to be equal to some matrix L times x at, at time t plus epsilon y, where maybe L is, is maybe I can see position and velocity, but that's all I can see, 1, 1, 0. So maybe I can observe position and velocity, but I can't observe A. OK, so that's a, that's a reasonable description of a dynamical system. Here's my state update equation. The first three are my state update equation. Here's my observation equation. OK, so all right, if I knew the structure of the system, if I knew h, if I knew the derivatives and so forth, then I could do this. But who gives me that? You know, how do I find these, these matrices? The problem that we're going to talk about today is in the context of linear systems. But the problem is more general because if I'm going to understand the structure of this, the dynamics of the system, then it would help my learning considerably. If I knew that when I hold on to a tennis racket, it's very similar to holding on to a ping pong paddle because all it's doing is changing the center of mass of my elbow 
then I could learn a heck of a lot faster than de novo, because I knew that this, all that it is is just a change in this parameter. So that's the benefit of knowing the structure of the system. But in principle, our problem remains one of estimating the structure A, B, C, and D. So I want to solve the problem today for you for a simplified version of the task. So we're going to assume that there's no noise in our system. In your textbook, you have the, um, the, uh, the version with, your, with noise at the end of it. So this is going to be chapter 9 to, I think today I'm going to cover 9.6. So um, our problem is as follows. We have uh, and what what I want to do is um, find we have been given u and we have observed y and what we need to find is x at time point 1 the initial conditions we don't know it we need to find a b c and d so the critical thing here is, I not only don't know these matrices, I don't even know the size of these matrices. So I don't even know the size of the state space, x. I don't know if it's a vector of size 2 or 20. So how do I find a, b, c, and d, and the initial conditions x? Um, the critical thing in today's lecture is that to begin with the understanding that there is no unique solution to our problem. So if all I know is the input to the system and the output y, there is no unique a and b and c and d. But regardless, I can reproduce your data precisely, even though there is no, no, no single solution to it. So I'm going to be able to pick from all these infinite solutions one of them that's going to be particularly easy for us to compute. And by doing so, we're going to precisely reproduce the relationship between inputs and outputs. And so let's begin with the understanding of why there is no unique solution. Why this particular input and this particular output could have been generated by an infinite number of A, B, and Cs. So to show you that, um, what I'm going to do is to uh, write the problem as follows. Suppose that I take my unknowns and I write them in a matrix form, A, B, C, D, like this. So this is a matrix made up of matrices. Now, on the right side of this, I'm going to multiply the states and the inputs. So A is going to multiply by X1, and that's going to give me x of n plus x, x2, and b is going to multiply u1. So a times x1 plus b times u1 is going to be x2. c times x1 plus d times u1 is going to be y1. Here I'm going to have x2 and y2, and that's going to give me x3 and y2. And this is going to go on to x of p plus 1. This is going to go on to x of p, u of p, and I'm going to get y of p here. So I know this, and I know this. I don't know anything else. So what if I multiply the left side of this equation by a matrix that's made up of a ma an unknown matrix T? So say, suppose I take this, and I multiply it by T0, 0, I. 
Well, what's going to happen is that I'm going to end up with t times x2. So t times x2 is 0 times y1. That's going to be here. 0 times x2 plus i times y1. This is going to be y1 here. This is going to become t times x3, y2 here, t times x of p plus 1, y of p is here. It's going to be equal to, this matrix also has to be multiplied to the right side of the equation. That becomes t times a plus 0 times c, and then t times b plus 0 times d, 0 times a plus i times c, and then the d here. Okay. So, I multiply this on the left side and right side by this, uh, by this matrix. So now what I can do is that you, you notice what has happened is that I have uh, transformed my x space in by, by some matrix T, some invertible matrix T. So if I now take the right side of this equation and multiply it as follows. So I multiply this by T. 0, 0, i. So this is an identity matrix. When I multiply these two, I get identity. So I didn't do anything. But now what I can do, I can multiply that through. Let me do it on this side. So I get Okay, so the point of this exercise was to show you that I have y from 1 to p, I have u from 1 to p, but if I just multiply my unknown x's by a matrix T, an unknown matrix T, I get precisely the same outputs from the same inputs, but with different a's and b's. So the point is, I can produce for you the same outputs from the same inputs with very different A, B, C, D than before. So there is no unique solution. OK. So if there is no unique solution, that's nice, because it says there are many, many solutions to our problem. What subspace analysis does is find one of those solutions. And those one of those solutions is all we need. And then once we have that solution, we have the system that's equivalent to anyone that generated our data. And that's what we're going to do today, is to basically identify 
um, one of those solutions. Okay, so to do that, um, the idea is, is as follows. I want to give you the intuition about what we're going to do. So our problem is that we have input u, output y. We know that our output y depends on some hidden state x. Okay, that hidden state x is evident in y. But the previous u's, the inputs, are also evident in y. So what we have to do is as, the, the problem is as follows. The outputs that we have seen is a, some linear combination of the state x and these inputs u. The input in the current time and all the previous times. If we could project our observations y in such a way that we could eliminate the influence of u, then we would end up with a system that's just proportional to the hidden state x. So what subspace analysis does is as follows. It says, project your data that you have measured, y, onto a space that's perpendicular to the inputs u. Well, that sounds pretty easy find something you know, perpendicular to a space u, well, what, what the heck does that mean? u is some vector of inputs, and how do I find this perpendicular space? Because it doesn't have to be just the last, you know, last input. My input u from the very beginning has influenced the current x. So the objective is to write our equations in such a way that I can project some matrix which has all my data onto a matrix that lives in a space perpendicular to the space spanned by this input u. So I need to define these terms for us. So we're going to begin with something simple. We're going to begin with just vectors. And let's describe what do we mean by projecting a vector onto another vector. Um, and I'm going to start with just the two vectors, a and b. So So suppose I have a vector a and a vector b. Now when I say project a onto b, this is what I mean. I'm going to write it like this. Project a onto b, put a slash, a slash there to describe this, this term projection. And what that means is that you know you do the usual thing. a is projected onto b. And what that's supposed to say is that, well, you take the magnitude of A, you find the cosine of the, um, the angle that describes the difference between these two vectors. So there's one vector here, one vector here. There's some angle of difference between them. That's alpha. And then you have a norm normal vector, B, that is normalized by its length uh, uh, divided. You know, so we do that by dividing it by its absolute value. So, when I project A onto B, I get a vector in the direction B with a length that depends on the magnitude of A, magnitude of B, and the cosine of the angle between them. So that's the typical, that's what we mean by projecting something. So um, this cosine alpha here, what does that mean? Well, um, if I write A transpose B, it's just a scalar, right? What this is, is, uh, is cosine of alpha times um, um, length of A times length of B. So cosine of alpha is equal to A transpose B times this. So that means that A projected onto B is A. So this is how I project a vector on another vector. A transpose B is a scalar. B transpose B inverse is a scalar. B transpose B, its inverse, is here. And then vector B is a direction of which a new, new, new projection is. All right, so what do I mean by projecting 
a matrix. Say, let's take, let's take a matrix A, capital A. It's made up of A11, A12, A13. Say it's a 3 by 3. Of course, that's equal to vector A1 transpose, vector A2 transpose, vector A3 transpose. That's our, that's how, what, we, what we mean by this matrix A. Um, what I mean by now projecting this onto some other matrix B, say I have a matrix B which lives in a two-dimensional space, so I have now B11, B12, B13, B21, B22, B23. So this B is one B1, B1 transpose, B2 transpose, and another B2 transpose. And this is a plane. They don't need to be perpendicular with each other. They can just be two vectors that are linearly independent. So what I mean by projecting this matrix A onto the space described by B, what I mean by that is that you take A1, so here's vector A1, and you project it onto this plane. You take vector A2, and you project it onto this plane, and so forth. You take the individual components of that matrix, and you tell me the components that end up with in the plane described by the matrix B. So when I want to write this as using matrix form, it goes like this. A projected onto B. Um, well, let me write it as a vector form first. Vector A projected on the space described by matrix B is going to be B transpose B B transpose minus 1 um, times B A. And the matrix A projected onto matrix B is going to be um, the individual components of this, which is A B transpose B B transpose minus 1 B. This is the definition of, uh, uh, of projection. Now, what's, what's important from our perspective isn't to project A onto B. What we're interested in is much more is to project A onto the space perpendicular to B. So what does that mean? So if B describes a, um, a plane, B perpendicular is a line, right? Is a line that's perpendicular to that plane. So if I want to project a matrix onto the perpendicular to this matrix B, it would be A projected onto this line. Each one of these A's projected those lines. This is equal to um, A multiplied by the identity matrix minus this. That's what I mean by project A onto B perpendicular. Of course, B projected on its perpendicular is just 0. OK. So that's our preliminaries. And now, what, what I, the reason why we introduced this concept is that what I want to do is write all my observations y in terms of all the things I don't know, x, and all the things I do know, inputs u. All the past history of x's that I don't know, and all the past history of u's that I do know, define this matrix, this, all, all the observations y. So you notice that y lives in the space defined by x and u. In a way, X is one of these guys, U is one of these guys, and then Y is a projection onto the space. So what I want to do, if I want to recover just the X, what I can do 
is take my data y, which depends on x and u, and project it onto a space that's perpendicular to u. And the way I'm going to do it is that I'm going to write a matrix that describes all my observations y, all my inputs u, and I'm going to project my observations y onto a space that's perpendicular to all my inputs u. And when I do that, I end up with some things that are going to be only dependent on x. They're going to be proportional to x. And that proportionality, hold on just a second, that proportionality is what, I'm, what I care about. Because remember, I don't need to recover x. All I need is something that's proportional to it. And if I can get that, then I can find a, b, c, and d. Yes? As long as they're linearly independent. So, uh, I guess maybe, is there a way to visualize that using your, the, the plane example with x and u is the v1 and v2? Yeah, because y depends on a basis set that has two things, x and u. Mm -hmm. It's a linear combination of these two, right? And so as long as, I can as long as I can get rid of one of those guys, I get what remains. It's going to be proportional to, to the x's. So the key idea is we don't need to recover x. All we need to recover is something proportional to x. And if we can find something proportional to x, then that's all we need, because we can then find our equivalent a, b, c, d for the problem. So there's a little bit of. Um, a little bit of matrix definitions that I need to show you because it, to do this, to do this problem um, using uh, uh, real data, what you need to do is build up histories. And here's here's the way it's done. The the, the matrices that are called um, Henkel matrices, and basically, what they are are histories of the inputs and the observations that you've had. So I have to. Um, uh, Hankel, sorry, H A K K E Y K E L. So you take matrix Y, one, one, and you write it like this. This is basically writing all the all the inputs that you have. Oh, sorry, all the observations you've had. Y one until Y I. And typically, I is a small number. It's, a, it's going to be a number that's going to be larger than the size of x. So you don't know the size of x, but you must have some guess of how big it is. You want i to be a little bit larger than what you think is the size of x. y2 running to yi plus 1. And this runs to yj to y i plus j minus 1. It's just a representation of my data, the observations that I've made. And so typically, i is much less than j. I have many more data points that I've observed than, than I have rows in this matrix. So this matrix is really long and pretty thin. And similarly, I, I represent my inputs u u1 i is going to be a matrix u1 um, intuitively it's basically a short term history and the question is how long of a history do you want okay so is this matrix it's very it's very long and it's it's very it's very thin and long so i is tiny compared to number of number of trials that you have j which is you know probably hundreds okay. so this is thin and long so it's like keeping the current time given the previous i yes yes okay. yes yes see in a system that has noise you need to average a little bit that's where this is coming from 
All right. Um, okay. So these are these are two matrices. These are things we know. Y and U. We can define these guys. Um, and things that we don't know. Matrix X is going to be described as um, uh, the uh, history of the inputs. Sorry, the history of the states that I that I uh, want to estimate. Xi, Xi plus one. It runs until X i plus j minus one. And um, some. Uh, matrix gamma that's going to be telling us how to go from state x to observations and uh, state updates x of i plus 1 that depends on c c a and c a times power of uh, i minus 1 and then I have uh, another matrix H and this matrix is diagonal terms are D off diagonal terms are 0 and this is C times B C times A times B C times B and so forth so these 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 things, H and gamma, are going to be used to describe the history of the uh, Ys and Xs. Um, and it goes as follows. This matrix Y, 1 sub I, is going to be equal to gamma I times Xi plus HI U 1 sub I. So all I've done is taken our state equation here and measurement equation and just write it in a way that I have more than one observation. I have the current observation, I have the previous observation, the previous observation, previous observation. I've just written it in terms of the hidden states x and the inputs u. All right. So this is my new observation equation. Now I need to write a state update equation that has this matrix instead of the vector x. So x is this matrix that represents my previous states, x. And I have the state update equation that looks like this. So I just want to write x in terms of the past, its past history. And so what does that depend on? So I have you know, x1 is equal to sorry, x2 is equal to a times x1 plus b times u1. x3 is equal to a times x2 plus b times u2, which is equal to a times a squared x1 plus a b u1 plus b times u2. And so um, I can define some new matrix gamma, uh, delta, delta i, to be a i minus 1 b, a i minus 2 b, up until b. And I can write this matrix x i um, plus 1 is equal to a raised to the power i x1 plus uh, delta i times u 1 sub i. So what I did is that um, I wrote the state update equation and uh, observation equation. All I've done is that I've extended the size of the state x and the observation y to make it so that it's more than just one. So we have some history here in, uh, in, each of these, um, in each of these. So this is the definition of y. We have this. This is, what, this is what we have as u. We don't know x. 
and we want to be able to recover something that's proportional to x. That's our goal. All right. So let me rewrite that over here. So I have y, 1 sub i, um, is equal to, what do we call it? Gamma xi. Plus um, h. So um, I can solve for this x. x uh, um, x1 this becomes gamma i it's pseudo inverse I'm going to put a star on top of it to mean the pseudo inverse of this uh, matrix gamma times 1 sub i minus Then I have uh, the state update equation, xi plus 1 is equal to ai times x, um, xi plus, uh, uh, plus 1, sorry, x1 plus um, uh, delta i u1 sub i. So I'm going to write down things that we, do, we know and things that we don't know. So I'm going to call this matrix W to be things that we know, we know. And um, this matrix W is made up of U and Y. And so if you look at this equation here, U and Y, and things that I don't know are going to be this matrix L, and the things that I don't know are, things I multiply by U, I have delta I, minus A sub I, and um, A sub, A, A raised to the power of I, gamma, So this I don't know. So that means that I can L I times W one I. Things I know. All right. So Now, if I write my observations, y, in terms of xi, things I know and uh, the inputs uh, the, uh, and, and the inputs to it. So I have say is equal to um, I plus one is this. So 
So what I can now do is um, project my y onto a space perpendicular to u. So what I'm going to do is take y and project it onto u perpendicular i plus 1, 2 i. So I want to get rid of this part here. So if I do that, what I get is If I did that right. Yep, okay. Um, I want to solve for this. This is going to be equal to this multiplied by this inverse. Pseudo inverse of that. Okay. Now, if I multiply both sides by W one i, so I get gamma i l i W one i is going to be equal to this times this times and this gamma i liw one i is x i plus one is equal to this. Okay. Now why is that interesting? Look what we just did. I know everything on the right side of this equation. I know y, I know u perpendicular, I know w, and I know u perpendicular and I know W here. Everything on the right side is known. This is known. The whole thing is known. It's just going to be a matrix. I'm going to call that O. The left side is a matrix times the states that I've, I've been trying to estimate, X. So here's X. And here's the matrix that's multiplying it. So what I've done is to reduce my problem to one where I have something that's multiplying my hidden states and that's equal to something that I know. So I, I can't recover this x, but I can recover something proportional to it. So it's kind of a magical thing, I tell you, when I first came across this. Because it's, it's the idea that you can recover the hidden states something proportional to the hidden states, even though you don't know A, B, C, and D. So we, didn't, we don't have to know A, B, and C, and D. All we know is that if we were to project our observations in such a way that we eliminate the influence of the inputs U, we end up with something proportional to the hidden states. And that, the idea is really comes about because in our linear set of equations, x depends on its past history and input u. y depends on x. So if I could take out all the, all the inputs and how they've influenced x, then I end up with something just proportional to x. y that I see is only proportional to x because I've taken out all the inputs. So if we take out this non-autonomous system that we manipulated via inputs u, and we take out all the if influence of u, and then what we end up with is just the um, uh, uh, influences of the hidden state x. OK, so again, what I end up with is this matrix O. O I can compute. 
because I know the Y's, I know the W's, and I know the U's. And if I, know, if I can compute O, then I can get an estimate of X. And I'm going to do that next. OK, so what's this, what's this matrix O? That's equal to gamma i times xi. And what's this gamma? Gamma is this matrix that's made up of C, CA, CA squared, and C times A raised to the power of i minus 1. That's this gamma. And what's x? It's um, this matrix made up of um, the state at time point x plus 1, at time point i plus 2, to time point um, um, i plus j. So I know O, but I don't know gamma and I don't know x. I can compute O. I can compute the multiplication of these two, but I don't know the individual components. So what we do is that we use uh, um, um, singular value decomposition to get something that, can, that, we, that we can handle. So basically, if we take this matrix O and we take the singular values, we end up with what's called the P, the S, and the V matrix. And the P matrix is. Um, a matrix that is made up of P1 to uh, PI. The S matrix are the matrix of singular values. It's, a, it's made up of uh, scalars S1, S2, and how many singular values there are in our thing. Let's say N of them, zero, zeros. And then V is going to be a vector of the um, associated with those singular values. It's going to be V1, Vj. Uh, So it turns out that the number of singular values, n, is going to be size of x, of the hidden state x. You recover the size of the hidden states via the number of singular values in the um, uh, singular value decomposition of this matrix O. Now, if you have no noise in your system, and the, and the simulations that you're going to run for your homework tonight has no noise in it, you're going, to get a, you're going to get the integer for your singular values. But in reality, when you do this with a real world system, what happens is that you get, of course, n that's as big as the input, input that you have. But when you look at the singular values, you'll see they have a few singular values that are large, and the rest of them are going to be tiny. And those are the parts that matter. That tells you the size of the hidden state of your system. By looking at the distribution of the singular values, you get the size of your hidden system. So in our, in our simulations, when we have um, uh, no noise, n is going to be exactly the size of the hidden state, x. So um, basically, our, the thing that we computed, and we find its singular value, psv, we can, of course, always write it as p take this S matrix here and find its square root, S1 half, S1 half times V. S1 half means the square root of this, this uh, diagonal matrix. It's just you know, the square root of each element. And that's also equal to P S1 half times T minus 1 T S1 half V, where v, T is some arbitrary matrix that I can uh, find as inverse. And so now, if I, if I say that my estimate of x hat is equal to this thing, t s1 half v, where if my estimate of the hidden states is this, you see that x hat is related to the true state x by just some linear transformation t. So, the, pr the procedure is to find this O matrix. Well, the procedure is as follows. First, you take your data, Y, 
and your input's U, and you write it in this matrix form. Next, what you do is you compute this O matrix, which is made up of Y, U, and U perpendicular. Next, what you do is you find the O matrix its singular values. You decompose it into uh, PSV matrix. And then you pick your estimate of state X to be S1 half times V, which is the uh, singular values that you, that you computed. And if you do that, you, you are basically saying that I'm within a T matrix of the true X. And T is just some arbitrary, arbitrary thing. If you estimate the hidden state X, of course, then you can go back and estimate A, B, C, D, right? So if you know the hidden state X, the input U, the measurement Y, you can, of course, compute A, B, C, D. That's what you're going to do for your homework. All right. Have fun. See you Wednesday. <laughs>